All right. Well, we'd like to reintroduce um, Albert Stagg and give him a warm welcome to our group. And thank you for coming to speak today, Albert. Yes, Albert um, is an organizer of the New England Backgammon Club. Uh, he was his, the club champion in 2015 and 2017. He's been playing backgammon since he's a teenager in the 70s and sounds like you were competitive right away with backgammon, but um, hit the broader ABT tournament scene the last seven years and has just become a fixture in our community. He has three published articles on the early game uh, third role tactics in Primetime Get Magazine. Uh, and then he maintains the New England Backgammon Club website. And if any of you haven't had a chance to uh, take a look at the website, there's a lot of treasures there, some memorabilia, lists of books, really an interesting website, not a typical club website. Um, and I'll find the link and, and put it in the chat. But um, thank you for coming, Albert. I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you. He's going to be talking to us about understanding <laughs> opening replies. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm, I'm very flattered to be asked. And um, it, it is a nice thing about the community that, you know, the more you get out and involved and improve your game a bit, the more eager people are to have you have you into little parties like this. So it's great. Um, yeah, I learned to play in the 70s uh, when Candace was having a good time in L.A. at the at the clubs. I was I was early teen just playing at a tennis club. And backgammon's always kind of come in and out of my life. And when I moved to Boston in the early 90s, there was a really thriving scene here. There was just, I, I was a school teacher and I had summers off and I would just spend the whole summer playing backgammon in Harvard Square. And that was really fun. It was a very, very forgiving learning environment, which I was above average in the field without really being very good, really. You know, but I was good enough to win more than I lost. So I was pretty casual about my learning and I just had a good time with backgammon and felt like I was a really strong player. Until the field winnowed down a lot and people moved away and the club kind of shrank. And then in the early thousands, there were only kind of six people left and I was below average. <laughs> and and uh, you know, I'm playing with Alex Zamanian and Herb Gerland and, uh, you know, suddenly I'm not on the winning side of the proposition. And, you know, it's frustrating to lose at backgammon. And, um, you know, I started to get surly and and truculent and, and all sorts of words you, you don't like to associate with me. <laughs> and at some point I just realized, look, I've got to raise my game because I'm just, I'm not competitive with these people. And so I need to actually work at it. And that's when I started hitting the books around 2015 and venturing more out into the, the wider circle of backgammon players. Um, so I, I mentioned all that because the early game was the first part of backgammon that I realized I really needed to study because I didn't get it. I just, I was really bad at the opening and I discovered why. So I'm gonna start this little PowerPoint and uh, let's see, open my share drawer like April taught me, okay, and uh, are you seeing that? Is that up? Yep. Okay, yep. Yeah. so right now all I'm seeing is my own PowerPoint because I can't see the you, you nice people out there. So I'm gonna have to rely on a little bit of auditory feedback to know that you're still with me. Um, anyway, when I was playing in Harvard Square, I was playing in a kind of backgammon called a chouette, which I hope most of you are familiar with, but. It's a game where one person plays against the rest of the players. The player alone is in the box. And here's a picture of me in the box against Bill Roberti, uh, you've probably heard of. <laughs> Matt Reclatus, you've probably heard of. Super strong player. And Ed Ahola, who you probably haven't heard of because he doesn't travel much, but he's also a, a very, very strong player. And why are these men smiling? I don't know if it's just me, Albert, but I, I can only see your... First slide. We, we only see the title slide. If you could please move on to oh, slide really? two so we could see that. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, you're kidding me. Nope. There, there we go. go. Oh, now you can see it? Yeah. yeah that's great. And I think uh, oh, Peggy okay. has a question. Peggy, was that oh, what you oh, were saying? 
Peggy, okay. you're on mute. <laughs> okay. Was there a question? Oh, no, I'm not hearing anybody. Peggy, Peggy, you're on mute. Where, where he is. Peggy, you are muted. You have your audio turned off. At the top of the screen, you should see a microphone symbol. It should have a, a line through it. If you click on it, you can unmute yourself. Maybe she can find it later. OK, so. Um, so now you are seeing a picture, but you're are you seeing just like like the whole ugly frame of PowerPoint? Is that we are, but it's OK. Yeah. We can, okay, we it's can okay. see it. You're, it. Yep, you're good. OK. All right. Well, that's another learning experience. So anyway, here's what I was talking about. This is a chouette and uh, I'm playing in the box alone in a chouette. One player plays against the rest and the, the player who wins remains in the box. So I'm playing Matt Reclatus right across from me and and to his right is Bill Roberti, who you might remember, might recognize. And on his right is Ed Ahola, who's an, another very strong Boston player. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> The reason they're smiling is if you look close at the picture, you'll see that they all own two cubes because I'm in the box and I just doubled them. And then they rolled some horrendous number, like five, five, I believe, and put four of my checkers on the bar. So <laughs> that was a, a kind of a memorable chouette, kind of classic chouette situation. Um, we do see the, it. Albert, what? We, we do see it. You do see it. Good, good. Oh, oops, yeah. OK, and now you're seeing the next picture? Yes, sir. OK, so we're good. So this is a, a large chouette. This is seven of us in the same place. There's me on the left and Matt Reclatus. Um, and chouettes in different towns have different rules. And in Boston, our rule is that you can't consult about plays until the cubes are turned, right? And that makes it actually more interesting. If there's consulting all the time, then usually the strongest players have their way and it can feel kind of homogenous. There are a lot of different reasons to have different rules in chouettes, but, but our rule was that there's no consulting until the cube is turned. What this meant was that I played for 15 years, highly competitive chouettes, where we talked about late and middle game positions where the cubes had been turned. We weren't allowed to talk about the opening. So I was not learning anything about the opening for all those years. And I kind of dismissed the opening. I thought, well, you know, checkers move around and then, you know, a situation occurs and what really matters is the cube action and knowing how to play a back game. Um, that turns out to be really not, not the right attitude. So early on, I realized I needed to get my head around the opening and I looked for books to read. And there weren't any. <laughs> there were no books about the opening in 2015. Uh, here are three interesting treatments of the opening. Uh, on the left, Be uh, Bag Eyes replaces Jeremy Bagai did a really great little white paper. It's a very rules based approach covering all of the opening replies. And it's very programmatic. So the first rule, and I have it right here, is you know, rule one hit outside. So if your opponent leaves a block somewhere in your outer table or his outer table and you can hit it, you should hit it. That's rule number one. And then sub rules uh, accrue. Well, what if you have a choice of two blocks to hit? Which one should you hit? If you hit with one number, what should you do with the other number? So there are sub rules. So you learn the sub rules. And then, <clears throat> of course, with every <clears throat> rules-based system, there are exceptions. So then there's going to be exceptions at the end. And there are about 12 major rules, and as you see, 26 sub rules. You know, and it's very, uh, very comprehensive. You know, and if you've got a brain that can do that, that's great. But my brain doesn't really work that way. I don't remember things very well, and I don't remember rules and subsets of rules. So I, I learned a lot from that, but it wasn't quite enough. Opening Concepts by, uh, by Michi, uh, if that had come out and if Bill's book had come out, I probably never would have worked on the openings. I would have learned enough from these books. Um, Michi's book is very accessible. Um, 
you've probably heard some of the proverbs in it, like break the mountain. He's had a great way with words where, you know, some of the, his ways of putting things just enter the, the vocabulary, you know, double tiger hitting twice in your home board. But it's not very comprehensive. It actually doesn't cover that many of the replies as a percentage of them. It's about the opening game in general. Um, just last year, Bill Roberti came out with how to play the opening. And this is a, a marvelously comprehensive systematic system uh, going through, it covers everything. Uh, and the approach that it takes is you roll the dice and you roll 2-1. How should you play 2-1 in every variety of situation? So, okay, your opponent opened with making his five point. How should you play 2-1? You know, your opponent ran with 6-5. How should you play your 2-1? And it, um, it looks for regularity. So there's something in common, as I note here. You know, how do you play the 2-1, 4-1, 5-1 replies? Because that usually involves a choice between slotting or splitting. So there's something in common. Um, so that, that's a, a marvelous text. And I've only made it halfway through the second volume. There are three volumes planned. Um, so lacking these, these opportunities, I just went at it myself. And my approach was kind of the opposite of Bill's. It just didn't occur to me to do it Bill's way. I just kind of went through methodically and I thought, okay, my opponent is going to make an opening play. How do I counter it? So here's a list of all the opening rolls. There are no doubles because you can't roll doubles in the opening. So my opponent plays a, a one, two and he slots with it. He plays uh, six, five with the one and, and uh, 13, 11 with the, with the deuce. You know, how should I, I, I went through all the, the, the numbers I might roll and how I should play them against them. And I just went all the way through all of these iterations. So there are, there are 21 possible roles without doubles. I'm sorry, uh, in the opening, there are 15 possible roles, right? Because there are 36 roles of the dice. I'm not gonna get too heavy in the math here, but I just want you to get a sense of the scale of the issue. You know, there are 15 numbers you can play and there are about 30 reasonable ways that people will play them. So if you roll three one, there's only one reasonable way to play that. You're gonna make your five point. I'm not gonna worry about an opponent who doesn't make the five point with three one. I'm not gonna spend time studying the replies to that, right? But I am gonna look at all these other variations. Um, boy, it's really bumming me out that the, um, the slides are not gonna work the way I planned them to. Anyway, um, uh, if you take the 30 reasonable opening plays and you multiply the 21 possible rolls that you can roll on the, on the reply, you have 651 positions. That's a lot. You know, 651 different possible opening replies. Why does this matter? Well, every game has an opening and you're going to get the opening reply half the time. The mistakes you might make tend to be small compared to big blunders you make later in a game. Like you'll make checker plays that are, you know, costing you a third of a point. In the opening, you're not going to make mistakes that big, but you're going to make them all the time. So it really pays to, to learn more about the opening. So you aren't just constantly giving away little bits of equity. And the third thing is that. The way you play the reply, and this is what I didn't get when I was a Chouette player, it really kind of determines the how the early part of the game goes. And I don't know if you've if you've had a bad session, you, you feel like you're always back on your heels. It's like, oh my gosh, my opponent always is getting the, the momentum in the beginning, and I'm always just you know trying to survive, or I'm getting stuck behind primes. You know, you just, you know, there's luck, but then there's also a feeling like you know, maybe you're not getting your fair share of sweet early positions. And that's what happens if you don't play the openings well. So I did that thorough examination and I created a, 
a document that's a lesson about it. And April has the document to give you. It's a PDF. Uh, I take kind of a thematic approach. It's not real rules based. It's kind of what's going on based. And uh, this Taskmaster program is a quizzing program. So you get to practice the positions that cause you most problem. And I'll show you that a little later. Okay. So now is the content part. Still with me? Still with me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes we're, we're here. here. We're yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. Listened intently, Albert. <laughs> okay. Um, wait, I wish I really could just play this. Uh... If, if you hit presentation mode and you share your screen instead of sharing an app, that usually works. A presentation mode? In PowerPoint? Huh. Yeah, this yeah, is we, Keynote. This is Apple Keynote. It. I know we okay. worked a little bit on it. It's a little bit tricky with Apple. I, I uh, can see it just fine. Is anybody else yeah. having trouble? Oh, good he. Let me just I only, I only me just one more time because I, like, I feel like we did click through it before and it did work. Let me just try it one more time and make sure it's not working. All right. So you're seeing opening game plans, right? Yes. Yes. Did the screen just change? No, mine no. did it. OK, that's no. not working. OK, <laughs> all right. So to get to the replies, we need to build a little concept just about how the backgammon game tends to go. And you may have uh, encountered these ideas. And if you have, uh, I don't think repetition will hurt. So. How do, how do backgammon games tend to go in the early going, you know, when you, you get to like early middle game? Here's a situation you don't like to see. So we're brown, we're going to the left, right? Can you see my cursor? Are you yes. able to see my Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. That's that's helpful. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, this happens. You know, you're stuck back on the 24 point, you're getting hugely primed. And this, this is not any fun. This is not a fun way to play backgammon. So that's a priming scenario that you, you'd rather not get into. Here's another bad thing that can happen. You get attacked, right? You, know, you split, your opponent rolls 5-5, five, five, puts you on the bar, and you dance. You know, or, or there are other variations on this where it's just, you know, you're, you're under attack, and you're, your opponent is threatening to close you out. Getting attacked is not fun. Racing, you know, your opponent rolls six five early on, and then a couple of rolls later, they manage to roll it again, and now he doesn't have any stragglers left, and you're down in the race, and you're you have to hit a guy in order to get back in the game, right? So this is still a playable game, but you know your opponent has successfully raced. Uh, so is that? Um, yeah, I thought one more. No, okay, those are the three. Uh, and those are the three I want us to be focused on. Uh, so priming, attacking, and racing. Keep, just pocket that for a minute. So opening imperatives. Uh, early game imperatives is like the, the central like concept of my paper. There are three of them if you get the opening roll, and these are going to be familiar to you. Points want making. Now I'm looking at the opening, not the reply here, but if you roll a 4-2, you're making your four point, and that's great. Points want making in the early game. Something that's a little less obvious is that these stragglers back here on the 24, they want splitting. You don't want those guys stuck back there, and you want to get them moving if you can. That's a good thing. Stragglers want splitting. And stacks want unstacking. This is Michi's break the mountain idea. So you've got these five checkers on the midpoint and five checkers on the six point, and they're not doing a lot of good for you there because when you're more diverse, you have more good numbers. You have more good ways to play. 
So all things being equal, you'd like to unstack these heavy points. And on your opening play, you're going to try to do some of those three things. Points want making, stragglers want splitting, stacks want unstacking. These are just good things. When you make an opening play, your choice of play will activate one or more of those game plans, priming, attacking, or racing. So if you roll 6-4, XG loves everything. You can do anything with a 6-4 and XG is happy. But what you do with 6-4 will lead to different game plan opportunities. So if you run with 6-4, which is a perfectly good play, you're pursuing a racing game plan. You're, you know, you're hoping by running this guy out here, you're hoping he gets missed. And if he gets missed, you're going to bring him around the corner, and then you're going to have achieved half of your problem with your stragglers. And you're just going to try to, you know, sneak that guy back around and also just not get hit again and bring home the race. XG is fine with you making the two point. This activates an attacking plan. And that, this is kind of hard to see, actually. Usually when you make a point, you're activating a priming plan because you're, you're making a wall. But this one is so deep that it's, it's not part of a prime because it actually blocks your own eight point. When you do this, you're really hoping to get in a blot hitting contest and get the better of it. So you're hoping this guy, your opponent, splits these guys and then you can attack them. Or you can do the splitting play. Play out to the 18 and down to the nine. And what's nice about this is it does everything. It starts racing a back man. If that checker doesn't get hit, you can bring the other guy up and make that point. Or if you can't, you can race this guy around. That's good for the race. Bring a checker down gives you more numbers that make a good priming point. It also brings more material into, these, into the attack zone. So if your opponent splits, you'll have more ammunition. So it does everything. And that's why a lot of people really like this opening. You'll see, I think most open level players tend to make this 6-4 opening. Um, but XG likes all, all of them. Okay, so now we're going to get to the reply part. Playing the replies well requires being sensitive to what your opponent is threatening. Has your opponent made an opening play that threatens to prime you, to race, or to attack you? Okay. So your opponent makes the four point with a four two. This is a priming play, right? Made a, a third point. You can see that if you, your opponent fills in the bar or the five, you're really starting to get in that ugly position where you're getting stuck. Here your opponent opened with a 5-1 and came down and split. Well, this is not very scary in terms of priming. Right? They haven't made a new point, and they haven't diversified at all to make it more likely that they'll make a new point. But a ninth checker in the zone is good for attacking, right? Because if you split here, they'll happily jump on you, and you get a block hitting contest. They just have more ammo because they have nine in the attack zone here, and you only have eight. So that's an attacking play. Here's that 6-4 running play, right? We've gone all the way out here. What are they threatening? Well, they're threatening to get away with one checker. You know, obviously, if you can roll a two, you'll hit it. But lacking that, you're going to need to um, uh, play, play for contact. So you're eager to split these back checkers. I feel like I'm missing uh, something there. No? All right. Okay. So. 
you note the opponent, like it's easy in backgammon to kind of go on cruise control. You know, your opponent makes a play, they make a play, you know, you roll and you start thinking about it. Well, what can I do? But when your opponent makes a play, try to get in the habit of getting nervous about something. Oh my gosh, I've got to worry about getting primed here before the dice come out of your cup. So ask what you're worried about and then try to do something about it. So a 3-2 reply here, your opponent has made your, your, um, their five point as they do with 3-1. You're chagrined, you hate that, and you roll 3-2. So what are you worried about? Someone help me out here? Priming. Hmm? Priming. Yep. So what are you going to do about it? Step up as prime as you can. You haven't called that yet. <laughs> Pardon? Hmm. I guess either running or waiting for an, something to attack, I would imagine. Or prime yourself. Split, split the back checkers. Oh, well, I wouldn't I... split the chat back checkers because he could point on my head. I, you know, I know it's unconventional, but here I would bring 13, 11, 13, 10. I want to start a prime of my own. That is exactly what I would have done in the 90s. <laughs> that was exactly what I would have done. And it's so interesting because I always thought, oh, my gosh, they've made an extra point. I don't want to split and get attacked. That seems nuts. Why would I want to split when if they hit me, you know, I'm going to have a harder time coming in. So I would have come down 13, 11, 13, 10 and tried to build a counter prime. This turns out not to be the right idea. Well, his eight point is stripped for one thing. He doesn't mm -hmm. have a lot of builders. Correct. I, I think I would go 13, 11 and then step up that back checker. That's a good idea. So it's imperative to split here. And that's exactly yeah. right. That your opponent made a good point, but your opponent didn't bring any new material into the field of attack. So there's still only eight checkers there in this attack zone. And that means they don't really have enough to go after you. They're not really wanting to attack you. They're trying to just build a prime and wall you in. So when your opponent primes, makes a promising priming move, it's imperative to split. And this is a nice opportunity just to give a little bit of like XG um, literacy here. I don't know how many of you have looked at these kind of number packed little panels down here. How many of you are real familiar with XG? No, I use it every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, and what's this showing us here is that the best play is splitting to 22 and coming down 13 to 10. Very close is splitting the other way. Often you don't want to split to the best point. Like your opponent would most like to make the 21. So often it's best to split to the second best place. At least you can see a six. Like if you roll a six, you'll hop out. That's the difference is very Sorry. So someone's rocking out. I I have been blitzed on with double fives far too many times to split with a two in the backfield. I yeah. hate doing that. You, it's it's painful, but you got to do it. And you know if they roll the three three or the five five, you know, you know those are good numbers anyway. If you're back there on the twenty four and they roll five five, they're making their three point. Your, your game is still bad. So you're and saying you don't slot the point that they would thematically make? Yeah, generally. That's a good general rule of thumb is if you have an option, you want to get to the, the three point here so you can see light six away. So you can leap this prime with a six. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but it's very small. If you look here, it's only 0 0.007 to split the wrong way. And you can even go up with both of them, 23, just play both of the back men up. It's solidly wrong at 0 0.021. But look how bad it is not to split. 13, 11, 13, 10 down is, is 0 0.047. And in the opening, that's really big. 
that's a really big mistake. Now, if you make an 047 in the middle of the game in a complicated situation or at the end, you'll make those all the time and not worry about them because you're making, I'm making 1.6 blunders, you know, 0.16 blunders and 0.95 blunders. But in the opening, an error of that magnitude is something to really avoid, something over 03. So your opponent is priming you, you must split if you can. You just have to do it. And you, you have to throw away the selective memory about people rolling 5-5 five, five on you. It just happens, and it's backgammon, and you, you grin and bear it. How about this? How about 5-2? What's your opponent threatening here? Well, he's very diversified and lots of checkers in the zone. 5-2 is like my most dreaded roll. I still <laughs> think I would split, though. Mm -hmm. because come if down hit, and split. If, right, come down and split. If hit, I've got all that room to re-enter and maybe even... Now, I don't want to... I have to use the make anchor correct because Albert told me it's make... Yes, make an anchor... When I re-enter, maybe I can make an anchor. I mean, I don't know. Yep. Yes, and that is going to be the play. Now, think of it from your opponent's side of the board for a second. If you're your opponent with those checkers where they are, what is your opponent hoping to do on his next roll? Make the five or the bar point. Right. Is your opponent eager to attack you down here? You can't from, really. the, from the 14 or 15. Yeah, and, and they're out yeah. of range, right? You're not even really stepping into a, a zone of danger. But your opponent is probably going to make a good priming point. So you want to get out ahead of that and definitely split. Definitely split to anticipate that. In fact, look if they roll 5-3. Are they going to point on your head? Probably. But, gee, they would have liked to make the five point with that 5-3. Right? Right, 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 right. Yeah. So some duplication there. Some duplication. So sometime when they're bringing down builders, if they're deep back here, they're mostly priming builders, where if this checker was more on the 16, it would be more of an attacking builder. Like here, this is 5-2 instead of the 3-2. Here's a 5-2. Well, now... Are they really threatening to prime you that much? Not nearly as much as last time, right? Right. And some numbers, like look at 6-1. Six, 6-1 one. Six, one makes the bar point or makes the five point. There's some duplication there. And here's this evil ninth checker in the zone. So this is an attacking stance, and you don't want to split. Here you want to play quiet and just come down because you're not really worried about being primed yet. And you are worried about these big stacks. Don't split against big stacks that'll unstack against you. Don't split against big stacks. Taking right. notes. Okay, you see these? That's yep. yeah. opening. Yeah. Because they got no better use for those checkers than to crush you with them. <laughs> You know, they'll hit loose and just have a blood hitting cut. And it's not like they're going to necessarily roll, you know, a perfect 3-3 three, three or 4-4. Four, four. It's that they're just going to pound you, and there's going to be a back and forth. There's going to be a blood hitting contest, and you're going to run out of ammunition before they do. So they get the better end of that. So don't buy into a blood hitting contest when your opponent has more in the zone. Here your opponents run with 6-5. Can you go back a second? Um, sure. I was always told that um, it's okay to split as long as you don't see them going into a blitz. And this is at least a few moves from a blitz. Um, <clears throat> well, the term blitz, sometimes people mean... Um, and in fact, it's interesting. When I wrote my Taskmaster essay, I used the term blitz, like a blitzing stance. And since I had some lessons with my mentor, Dave Presser, 
he and Chris made it reserve the idea of a blitz as when you go all out for the closeout. You know, when when you're really gonna just abandon all the other game plans and just go for the closeout. And that doesn't usually happen in the first few exchanges. But you do get attacked. And you don't want to open yourself to attack, even if it's not a blitz. You don't want to play into your opponent's favorable game plan. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So 4-3, your opponent ran all the way. They're up in the race. They've escaped a checker. You counter that by trying to create contact. So you're definitely splitting there. It becomes more important to get these guys split and to, you know, create some bad numbers for them and give you multiple ways to hit them if they leave a blot in the outfield. Um, <clears throat> okay. So broadly speaking, split against the priming threat. You've got to get the straggler split when your opponent starts to prime you, even if it's scary. It's off. It's usually scary, but it's it's not going to get easier to split once they have two more checkers in the zone. It's only going to get harder. Split against a racing threat to try to create contact. Don't split against an attacking threat, and that's when your opponent has extra checkers in the zone, and they're stacked up and not really threatening many numbers that prime you. Okay. So a few slides ago, I, I mentioned the opening imperatives. You know, when you have the opening play, points want making, stragglers want splitting, stacks want unstacking. On the reply, there's a fourth one, and it's the most important one. Blots want hitting, right? If your opponent leaves a checker and you can hit it, you usually want to hit it, and that's going to be uh, top of the list. And these are kind of in order. Blots, making points. Points are really valuable because they're permanent. You know, you split and maybe you get hit and things move back and forth. But, man, you make that four point and it's there for the rest of the game. So, Blots one hitting. Five, three. This is non-obvious, or it was to me anyway. Your opponent splits with 4-3, and you roll 5-3. You point on him, or you hit? Hit. Yep. Double tiger. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not the double tiger. Not the double tiger. Um, I'm not that brave anyway. No. So why not the double tiger? It's just um, you're making them a big favorite to hit you back. And, and mostly, um, you don't want to put a checker down on your ace point when you, you don't have um, – you only have eight checkers in the zone. To do the double tiger, you hit here and you hit there. And you still only have eight in the zone, and you, you don't have enough to really pursue a, a real blitz, which is what you're doing when you put a checker on the ace point. Um, right. So you, you hit – you frustrate your opponent. You, you send them back, you know, you're likely to get hit back, but that's backgammon. How about here, 4-2? You hit here? I would absolutely hit there. Yeah, me too. All right. We like the spirit. You really don't want your opponent making your bar point. You know, you, you make your four point and it feels nice and you're hoping they don't do anything, but... They either make your bar point or they run away with this guy. And, and then it's easier for this guy to, you know, the other straggler to escape. So, yeah, you set them back on their heels. How about 3-1? It's wrong to hit here. You want to just make your five point with 3-1. Despite everything we just said, this is one of those exceptions. So in... Uh, Jeremy Bagai's paper, this would be one of those exceptions. Or uh, can, you, can you think about the principles of the opening here? And why is hitting with 3-1 going to be wrong when hitting with 4-2 is right? Because it's always better to make that five point. Definitely. The five point is a substantially stronger asset than the four, right? 
Yeah, that's with one the, thing for sure. With the four two, also Albert, you're bringing another one into the attacking zone. So you have a ninth checker there, where if you just hit with this three one. There you go, right? Don't. And that's that's big. You're stripping the eight point by hitting with the ace. Um, and you can bring down the three, and that does bring another checker in the zone, but it, it leaves two blots open. There are a bunch of shots that hit you back, and you know between that worst distribution and the higher value of the five, it's just right not to hit here. So this is just something you got to learn. And you know, 20 years ago, people might have argued back and forth about this, mm -hmm. and this is where the robots came in, and kind of we trust them when they say it's 0.046 better. Uh, to just make your five point. So some of this is just learning, learning positions. But I'm impressed that you guys do to hit with the four two <laughs> and the five three, which is great. Um, okay, I'm going to move along a little bit more briskly because I want to make sure to get to some other things later on. Uh, so I'm just going to comment on these as we go by. Um, four three, uh, hitting and coming down is often a nice option. Here you have that option. Some This is a real kind of rookie play you see a lot. Um, a lot of players will hit on the four and then hit on the ace. Can't resist that double shot, double hit. And it's really solidly wrong uh, because you want to leave a checker on a point where, that you want to make. And notice if you come down with the three, you're six away from that spot. So if your opponent hits you at the four, when you come off the bar, it gives you a good six. Your six won't come in, but your six will hit them back on the four. And you can often look for that. So don't be eager to, to rush down to the ace point when you hit on a high point. Fight for the points you want to make. That's a quality point. Don't hit and run. Three, two, on the other hand, it's a lower point. And coming down with the two, this wouldn't really be in the action. So here it's right to hit twice. Also with a 4-1, it's just going to be right. You're, you're sending the checkers so far down south to hit anyway. And there's just nothing else good to do here. You don't want to split up to the 20 and walk into this nightmare. And um, there's just not much better to do with a 4-1. This is a this is a lovely kind of position. I like that 4-3 that hitting play. Um, You've you rolled a five two here. Your opponent is split to your bar. It's often hard to see this, but you want to hit on the ace point, and this seems to fly in the face of what we just said. Well, you don't want to put a checker low in the board, but uh, you frustrate your opponent's desire to make your bar. You get to hit, put them on the roof, and you get to split at the same time. Stragglers want splitting. So you're splitting a straggler, you're unstacking your six, you're frustrating your opponent. There's a lot of good reasons to do this with the 5-2 and the 5-4 in this position. And if you get this right, you'll, you'll often impress people. Like, it's almost like in a match, if, I, if this, my opponent has this reply and they don't hit, I always go, ah, okay. Um, you know, they, they're, not, they're not stronger than I am, <laughs> which is a nice feeling. Okay. Or they didn't watch Albert's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and finally, on, on the hitting, like the other big thing, and this is this is blessedly kind of intuitive and kind of simple. You often have a choice to hit in your outfield, and then you have a choice what to do with the other numbers. So six three, you want to hit here, bingo, and you have a three to play. You can split, or you can come down. When you hit from the midpoint, you've already unstacked your heavy point, so you split. Stacks one, unstacking. You're unstacking with the hit. You don't have to unstack again with the three. So you take that opportunity to do another good thing. You get to hit, unstack, and split. That's better than unstacking twice. On the other hand, 2-1, here you're going to hit with the ace. What do you do with the two? 
I would bring one down. Absolutely. Because now I'm stripped on my eight point. Yes. That's kind of an ugly gap there. You want to diversify, you know, give yourself more ways to make the, the bar point or to make your five point. And you haven't unstacked. So you unstack. Hit and unstack. So when you're hitting in the outfield, you always want to unstack, basically. If you unstack by hitting, you split. If you don't unstack by hitting, you unstack. It's really nice when there are regularities. Like, there are exceptions. OK. How are we doing here on time, uh, April? Um, we're doing fine. Keep going. OK. Um, <coughs> Doubles. doubles are always nice, but doubles are easy to misplay because you have to play four. You have to play four checkers, so there are just a lot more ways you can go wrong with them. So uh, you don't want to misplay, you know, your, your best roles. So it's it's worth getting a, a grip on them. The approach I take to to doubles is that there's kind of a default move to make with doubles, and that's going to be your go-to. And only if the position dictates something different should you do something different. So you want to know these default plays. With 4-4, four, four, it's tempting to hit this checker on the deuce. You can blitz here, but you don't have that much material. Again, you only have eight checkers. Uh, with 5-5, five, five, you don't have much else to do because these guys are, are stuck, right? But with 4-4, four, four, you're much better off with this balanced play. Two up, two down. If making the five point is so great, why don't we do that? That's an excellent question. Look how far down five, making the five point is. Boy, that's 0.143. It's a big, big blunder. But and why? The, the simple why, and this is a really, really good thing to write down and remember, is that especially in the opening, two good things are better than one better thing or one great thing. So making the five point is a great thing, but making your opponent's five point is a really good thing. And making your nine point and unstacking your mid and bringing checkers into the zone is another really good thing. So by making your five, your, uh, you're not getting all that you can out of the role. And it's not just with doubles, it's with a lot of other plays. Two good, two really good things add up to one great, more than one great thing. Um, and another thing is that this is a really good racing role. 16 pips is you're moving a lot of weight. And if you leave your back men on the 24, they're really starting to fall behind. All your other checkers are moving forward and it can lead to a situation where your opponent counter primes you and it's hard to get those guys up. Three, three, same idea. Balance play, two up, two down. It just does a lot of stuff. It, it's good for uh, uh, priming. It brings material in the zone for attacking. It gets your back checkers up for racing. It secures an anchor if you wind up in a holding game. Good balanced play. 2-2. Two, two. Here's an example. Your opponent has played a 5-1 opener. They've got those stacks. Not threatening to prime you. There's really no motivation to get those guys moving. Absent a priming threat, you just want to play offense. Bring two down and make the four point. Good for priming. Good for attacking. Again, two good things, better than one great thing. Like 24-20, you might be tempted just to take their five point. I mean, that's kind of awesome. But it's one great thing when you could be doing two really good things. Unstacking both your heavy points. Default play. 5-5 five, five is pretty forced. If they're not split, it's, it is basically forced. If they're split, you're attacking. You're going to go after them in that. Early reply. Why did I? Uh, oh, uh, so I, this is just another little opportunity to get a little more familiar with XG. Um, 
So the five five plays you can see here are very close though. You could play quietly 13 to three with two. It's only 006, these are essentially tied. There's really nothing in it. But if you look at the figures here, you'll see why. If you go after them on the blitz, you win more gammons. So these, this line of row of numbers here is your win percentage. You win 51%, you gammon him 20%, and you win a backgammon under 1%. No surprise there. If you play quietly, you win slightly more, 1% more, but your gammons drop way down from 20 to 16%, right? So these positions are, these plays are essentially tied in a, at a match score, if you're a double match point, you don't want to blitz because the gammons are worthless. So any, any score where the gammons aren't useful, you would make the quiet play. But generally you're gonna, it's just default. You're gonna you're gonna blitz with five five. And these are all money games that your your scenarios yeah. are all money games. Yeah. Right. And you really do want to learn your replies for money games and then learn how to alter for score. It's just um uh it, it just adds to confusion to to try to get too far into the weeds on match score considerations. How much does it change for when they're match when they're match points? How much how much does the equity change on the replies when it's a match when it's a match game? Not a lot, except on particular plays. There there are, I think. And I'm not the best person at this. I'm not. Uh, I'm not comprehensive in my DMP versus gammon go versus gammon save. Okay. Uh, there are certain things like six two. If you roll an opening six two, and it's gammon go, and you really gammons are valuable. You want to slot the five point with a six two, which is the way I always played in the nineties. <laughs> but I, I learned it was not the thing to do. Um, so yeah, there there are different things to do when match play comes in. But uh, I would really encourage you to get very confident with the standard replies before branching out into the, the exceptions uh, and, and modifications. Kind of the same with cube action. Um, you know, understanding when to double and when to take, you wanna study it for money and then learn how to adjust for match score. Uh, six, six, standard, you up and down. And so three, three, four, four, six, six, this this up and down thing is pretty constant. It just moves your checkers where you want them to go and uh, doesn't overplay your position. There's no reason to go after this checker on the ace point. You're only knocking him back one pip and you're not gonna close him out really. Okay, so that's doubles, uh, but then when you get into the reply situation, you want to ask, is there something about the position that would make me want to play it differently? And somehow we didn't, I skipped the one, one slide, but the standard one, one is to make your five and you make your seven. Of course, that's very appealing, but when your opponents split and you give them a direct six, you don't want to do that. It's not worth, the bar point isn't that valuable that you want to give your opponent a direct way out to hit you in, in the process. So you make the five and you just split. Oh my God, I can't believe, okay. Is that surprised? I got, I got in a huge argument with my ex-boyfriend about this. <laughs> Cause he was going for the bar point and I says, no, I'm giving you a direct shot. I think I need to split. Right. Yeah, um, there is a real tendency um, for, uh, for players who haven't studied carefully to overvalue the bar point. There's a, some uh, newer players seem to feel the bar point is just, um, you know, it's in and of itself a great point to have. It's, it is a good point to have, but once your opponent has split or has made an advanced anchor, it's a lot less valuable than it used to be. It's kind of like the, you know, the barn door is open and you're kind of swinging it shut. 
you know, on the wrong side. Um, okay, well, he wasn't, yeah. a new, he wasn't a new player, but. <laughs> well, he might have been like me. He might have been a, you know, he learned too early like I did. And these young people who learn, you know, the people who just began in the last five years have a huge edge because they don't have to unlearn all this stuff. I Okay, he wasn't young either, but I'll stop now. <laughs> okay. Uh, two, two. Uh, now here. So, um, can I just ask, because um, if they're not split, then the bar point becomes much more valuable, doesn't it? Exactly, yes. If they're not split, then you would absolutely make the five and the seven. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. But once they've split, not. Or in general, I'm thinking, like, even if you're past this opening reply, mm -hmm. it seems like making your bar point, because it seems like when they can escape, it's usually six, five or six, six, you know, or they're trying to make your bar point. So, so I just wanted to clarify that, that it's, I get it when they're split, you don't want to do that. But if they're right. either not split or they haven't escaped yet, even further on down the line, you, your bar point becomes pretty important, I would think. So, oh yeah. If, and especially if your if your opponent still has two checkers on the ace, the bar point is just massively, massively valuable. Okay. You trade the eight for the, for the bar in a shot. If they've let, let's say they've escaped with six five, um, at that point it uh, it's a little less clear. I'm, see, I'm not even sure if you're supposed to split at that point, just because you know that earlier principle that if they've escaped a checker, um, you want to split. I'm actually going to just put that in real fast. Opponent runs and. You roll one, one, and yeah, no, you just make the, you make the both points if your opponent ran with, with six, five. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, you're just trying to, hold you're actually looking to attack that guy. Yeah. Um, you want to hold him there. Okay. Okay. Um, two, two is interesting. So, you know, the default play for that was to make your four and, and 11 points. But here, as we learned earlier, your opponent has diverse point making numbers here, all these diversified spares threatening to prime you with some good prime number. So that are used for getting these back men moving, but notice you just move them up to the 22. You don't go all the way to the 20. Take the 22, that's an advanced anchor, it pressures this checker. You do this other really good thing, you know, making another, making a point in your home board. Now you've got an advanced anchor and you've got a stronger board and your opponent has to clean up this checker. Um, going all the way to the 20 is just more than you need to do. It leaves you a very nice point, but you're totally undeveloped here. Again, two good things, better than one great thing. Um, the other option there with the 2-2 is to hit this guy, and this is another one of these exceptions. And again, because two good things are better than one great thing, making these two great points is better than hitting this guy. You generally don't want to use three or four numbers in your doubles to hit a checker. So if you roll 3-3, three, three, you're almost never going to hit a guy on the 15 point with three of them. You're going to make two points somewhere. And the one exception is it's always good to know exceptions when your opponent rolls six, four. It just happens that on this one, you do want to hit that guy. I just dropped this in there because, you know, there are rules of thumb and there are guidelines, but there are exceptions. This is the, the only one really when they split because they you're, you're interrupting them from making your your bar point. Three, three um, here. You know, it feels superfluous to come up with the with your back checkers. You're not getting primed, and you have a checker to hit here. So you're definitely going to hit. And this time you make your three point. You want to stack your two heavy points. You leave no blots. You don't worry about the back checkers because they're not getting primed. And how you're in attack and priming mode. Hmm? How far down the list is 13, 10 by 2 and 8, 5 by 2? 
Uh, it's solidly wrong. It's 051. It's second best. Well, it's tied for second best. Um, I actually think I gave you this. So this is what that looks like. I anticipated that being somewhat attractive. Um, this checker distribution should just not look good. It doesn't, but I love yeah. that five point. Yeah, yeah, and it's reasonable. And, and you know, and there are times when the ugly play is right, um, but you you still haven't unstacked these checkers. You've lost your eight point, and uh, you know these checkers are bearing on the four, which is good. But they're otherwise a little bit out of the action, although they're, they make builders for this. Um, this is the from the correct play. This is what you're left with. And um, both of these checkers act as builders for the sweet spots you want to make, or for the bar. And leaving um, leaving no blots is valuable. Two six three five four four here or or Pretty big jokers. Even if he rolls a four three, you're kind of embarrassed. These checkers are kind of out of play now. You're going to play behind him. Um, so this this just should look better. Okay, so um, there are some other topics in the PDF that April will will give you. Um, for instance, slotting the ace, slotting your five with an ace is often a good idea, but not always. Um, there's another question of when it's right to play a six from your straggler out to the bar, whether to leave it there or to keep running. Like if you roll a six two, you know, should you should you split and down or should you run all the way? So that's covered in in the article. Um, and I did want to just introduce you. I don't know if any of you have an iPad, um, but uh, I just want to give you a flavor of what I built here. And after my teaching career, I, I wound up doing film preservation and archival work. And I did a lot of work in FileMaker Pro uh, database developing. And I created this Backgammon Taskmaster program in FileMaker Pro, which is for, it's designed for an iPad. And there's no, there's no Windows version. So it doesn't work on anything but an iPad. Um, and I need to get out of this drawer, stop sharing that. And let's see if this, oh, oh, there it is. Is that, oh, the Taskmaster? Yeah, we can see it, yes. Okay, good. So this is what it looks like on an iPad. And basically there's the lesson that you can page through and read basically all the stuff that's in the PDF. But the real good part of this, this program kind of pleased with is this quizzing aspect. So there are three sets. There's just the opening roles, what to do with them. Here's the, the juice, the, the meat of it. The replies there are 194 positions here. And then I also added 130 or so continuations, something beyond the third role that just engages these topics. And you can choose which of these sets you want to quiz yourself on. And then you can do them in study order, in the, in the lesson order, or random order, or my favorite, which is mastery order, which draws on your past performance to throw the harder problems at you. So I've done this. You can see here on the replies, it says my mastery level is 85% on this. Uh, and I wrote the thing, and I'm still not 100% on it. I can't remember stuff. I have to review it over and over. So when I go to a tournament like Chicago, I've got my iPad on the plane. I go through all these replies. And this is what it looks like. So here's a position, 4-3. Any ideas here? It's a, kind of a tough one. What should we do with a four three here? I'd come up with the four and down with the three. I would go, I would go down I'd, with the four and split with the three. I'd come down and with, with the four and hit with the three. Oh. <laughs> I like hitting with the three and splitting the back man also. Okay, hit and split. There are a lot of reasonable things to do here. 
right? So on the Taskmaster, basically, you make your, you you think about it, and then you tap the board, and the answer is revealed, along with a little commentary I made. And this is sort of I wrote this for myself, like just to I get this wrong. <laughs> so the right play is to split and hit. Seems unusual. When you could hit and come down. See, I, I find this really seductive. I want to come down with the nine to back up that three with a six, just like we did on the three two before. Remember, we came down with the three and hit with a two. It seems like the same, but it's not. After hitting, unstacking the mid brings a checker that backs up your attack nicely six pips away. Annoying to find this usually successful formula turns out to be second best when you're hitting this deep on your three point. Is this worth learning? Maybe. Most people play their two, three split the other way. So this is actually, I stuck this one here in first because I wanted to bring your attention to it. 13, nine, six, three is wrong by 0.011. Now that's pretty small. Uh, I generally don't worry about things under 0.01, and this is just over it. And it's nice to get everything right and to feel like, you know, you make no mistakes. But my fear is unless I really learn this position and remember, oh, it's 2 3 split wrong and 4-3 follow-up, I might start making mistakes in other positions that I normally get right. <laughs> so if I, if I start thinking about this, then I might start getting the, the other play wrong when the checker's on my four point. You see what I mean? I'm like, well, maybe it's okay with me to make a little bit of an error here, just playing this the way that seems logical to me. You see what I mean? Um, so the point here is that this is a self-scoring program. After you look at the answer, you can say, got it wrong, or I got it right. And if you're like, you know what? This is a very close call, and I'm kind of happy playing it this way. It makes sense to me. I like to be aggressive. It probably wins some more gammons, slightly more gammons. It does. You can see here. I'm just going to say I got it right because it's right enough for me. So I click, I got it right. And then up here in the corner is this little history. And what this is showing me is that I got it right this time. The last two times I got it wrong. And the taskmaster keeps track of this as a weighted average. The newest decision is more highly weighted than the older decisions. And it gives you a sort of a mastery rate on it. Um, and that's how it knows if you want to quiz in mastery order, which ones to throw at you first. So here's another three, four. And you would just sort of merrily go along. Three, four, I assume we're hitting here. I'm not going to the ace point. I'm getting a little quiz factor here. We I would have thought this hitting. Earlier, didn't we? Or very similar position. So you slot your five point, you mm -hmm. hit on your five point. And I think the previous screen said to split the back. But I think over the board, I would bring one down. Yeah, because you're going to strip that eight point. I would go 13, nine with the four. Yeah, isn't that what we just discussed? Yeah. I would like to think that's right. So hitting there, since you didn't unstack with the hit, you unstack with the second checker. Oh, here's another exception to the rule for coming down after hitting loose in your home board. Well, because we had another one, remember, that said if you bring down that 13, you know, from the 13, you've got so many shots back that you're basically, you know, they're going to be hitting you with too many shots because there was another play that we it looked was at another position but there was more checkers in the zone with that your opponent had more checkers in the zone with that other position i think he had a uh checker on his um what is that 11 point and 10 point here he only has one on his 10 point right right so that's that is exactly what you should be trying to do is trying to find the distinctions oh why is this surprising why was it different in that other similar position? Um, and that's what I'm trying to do here. I, I, I did note 
Uh, you duplicate fives by stepping up. Note that when you step up there, they have fives off the bar to hit you and fives to hit you here, as opposed to if there was a checker here instead, then a six would hit you and maybe it wouldn't be right. Um, so that might be working itself in. You're always trying to infer or intuit, you know, why the robot does what it does. And, um, you know, unless you go through two and three uh, deep on all the possibilities, it can be hard to figure. So you're always trying to come up with a rationale or a way to remember it. It's like, oh, splitting is good here because it dupes fives. Even if it's not actually what's going on, it's a way to remember it. But again, here, it's a 0.014. It's not a huge mistake to do the natural play. And that's what I wonder here. It's up to you whether it's worth you know, muddying the water to try to get every one of these right when the error is so small. What you don't want to do is hit twice. That's the big thing here is if anybody's choosing to hit twice here, that's a big no-no, OK? So again, you can decide whether you got it wrong or right by your own, by your own standard. And move hey, along. Albert, we're getting a question on how do you get a taskmaster? If you have oh. an iPad, how would you access this? Right. So um, it's uh, on the um, if you if you just Google backgammon taskmaster, <laughs> you'll come to there's a page on the New England Backgammon Club uh, website under resources that's devoted to it. And I have like five lessons on there. And you just have to download a free app. It's um, called FileMaker Go. It's for free. You download the app. All the instructions are there on the site. So um, I, I found your link and I put it in the chat. Please Thanks. do. Yes, please do. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Anyway, so that's, you know, this can go on and on. And um, when you, you go through the quiz and when you're ready to stop, you exit the quiz and it says how many you got right out of the ones you just did. Uh, you can resume the quiz, pick up where you left off. Review your errors is kind of fun. So when I'm really training and when I go on that plane trip, I do all the replies. Let's say I get 80% right. I click review your errors. It just gives me the 20% I got wrong. I do those 20 over again. Let's say I get half of them right. <laughs> then I've got 10 left. I review those and I just keep going through until I've, you know, I've gotten them all right. Uh, and that generally is enough for me. But, you know, I, there are a lot of players around Boston who just all they need to do is learn a position once and they know it like Alex Amanian. He just, oh, yeah, you know, two, three, split, four, three. You have to do this uh, or Marty Storer, for God's sake, you know, encyclopedic, you know, memories. And I'm just that's not my strength. I, I just can't do that. So this is a way for me to, you know. I have to come back and back to, to these sorts of things. Um, and I hope we have time. I'd like to do this one more little thing, which is uh, an XG-based thing. Just another great way to uh, practice this stuff. It's my favorite thing to do with, X, with XG. If I can find the right screen here. Okay, is that showing up? Yeah, six yes. four yes. roll. Right. Okay, so if I want to use XG to practice my opening replies, there's a way to go about it, and I I outline this on the on the slide that I'll come back to after this, um, so you don't really have to take notes because you'll be able to see it. Um, I'll just walk through the steps here. You go to file, you set up a position, file, new, set up position. It starts with the opening, opening board, which is convenient because we're studying the opening. I want to study the replies, so I'm going to put my opponent on roll by clicking on this arrow thing so that my opponent, he rolls on the you know, on the left-hand side of the, the board. So I know my opponent is on roll. I don't want to give him a roll, though. I'm going to give him, the, you know, he's going to start as the roller, the doubling decision, and nobody's going to double on the opening play. 
So this is the position I'm interested in, where my opponent plays and then I have a reply. Since this is what I want to do, I'm going to copy it to my my uh, my uh, what's the thing on a computer when you copy to your uh, <laughs> copy to your clipboard. Clipboard. Thank you. Control C, right? Control C or Command C on an Apple. I'm going to get that position stored on my clipboard. Then I'm going to go to Setup, Play from Position. It's going to say, OK, new game. I'm, the, I'm player one. I'm at the bottom. The top player, I want the robot to play. So I have to click XG here. This is a human. I want a robot to play me. And then I can choose what level. And it doesn't really matter. I don't really care. Don't go on the really high settings because it'll take a long time thinking. Champion is fine. Expert is fine. Expert will make some mistakes, and, and that's fine. It doesn't really matter. I always just choose whatever shows up because I don't want to waste a lot of time clicking in menus. So whatever it is, I hit OK, and it plays. Now, a great example happened just right off the bat. 2-2. Two, two. You can't open with 2-2. Two, two. Now. In that case, I can just I just go Control V. I don't want to save the game. I paste it back in from the clipboard, and I just try again. And he rolls doubles again, <laughs> right? So this is kind of a flaw. It should only happen one in six times. Of course, we're two for two, but you know you can actually go ahead and let them have doubles, and just it might be interesting to see how you should play in those positions. It could be kind of fun. Uh, but um, let's try to get to a real position here. Six, six again. All right, I'm just going to play it. You, I roll my dice four two. This is actually interesting, but it's pointless because this doesn't happen. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to wager that I'm supposed to split here and slot. It's kind of by deep by kind of impulse you want to make the four point. But you can make the four point easily later. He's not going to hit you. And it's really crucial when your opponent has winning the racing thing, right? Definitely threatening a racing game here. I've got to split to get contact or to get an advanced anchor. I hope that's right. Double. OK, I'm going to take it. Uh, yeesh, it's crushing me. OK, anyway, here's the, the next part. So we're playing here, and we're in competition mode, which means it's all secret. You click on this competition mode, and you go into teaching mode. And then you can look at the transcription and see that I actually got it wrong. <laughs> uh, it actually liked making the four point. So that surprises me. I wrote the whole article on following up 6-6. Six, six. Anyway, it's not a realistic position, so I don't feel that bad about getting it wrong. But anyway, you you um you reveal this teaching mode so that you can see the errors as you come in the play. Let's try it again. I paste it in. Play from position. April, have you been playing with my computer or something? My opponent <laughs> is rolling nothing but doubles. I wouldn't do that to you. This is really funny. I'm starting to wonder if this is on some weird setting. Is that like six in a row? This is really a bad advertisement for this method. OK, thank you. All right, five, one, three, two. All right, what's our opponent threatening? What are we worried about? Anyone? Are we worried about getting primed? No, would there, we don't want them to make my five point, my own five point. Be nice to present, prevent that if you could. The big question here is whether to split. Do you want to split or do you want to come down with two? This is actually, a, this is one of the tougher replies, I think. Don't want to come down with two because it's too easy to be hit since he is split. Right, right, yeah. So this is a case where uh, everything is bad, right? If you come down with two, you got eights, nines, tens all hitting. 
Which I just seems down. like a lot. That's a I'm lot of hits. 13, hmm? 11, and then 24, 21. So splitting. Yeah, you don't like to split into stacks, but sometimes you just have to do it. This seems safer if they hit you with a fly shot you can get a high anchor. You know, you might get attacked, but what are you going to do? OK, so let's say that's our play. And then let's go into teaching mode and go back to the play. And yeah, and actually two down is about the same. There's not much in it. Um, even 13-8, which is, you know, you almost never want to play 13-8. Even that isn't that bad. So this is probably a position I wouldn't put in the Taskmaster just because it's hard to go very wrong on it. Uh, it's a selection of, of difficult plays that actually cost you substantially. I have a question. Yep. In your opponent's position, because earlier in your instruction, you know, be sensitive to what your opponent is doing, right? In this position, what is my opponent doing? Is he, he has several checkers in the zone. So mm -hmm. is he attacking? He's mm -hmm. not very diversified, so I don't think he's priming. Correct. This is an attacking stance. So attacking, you said you play quiet against attacking. Mm -hmm. Right. So wouldn't the quiet move be two down? Wouldn't yeah. that be the quiet move? It would be, it would seem, it would seem quieter, except that there is so many hits. There's so many fly shots at it. And it just goes to show there really isn't those those imperatives and the guidelines are, you know, they're quite broad. Right. And that's why you have to study all these positions. And and you are faced with, what you're faced with is just multiple uh, criteria that point in opposite directions. Right? Right. So, uh, you know, generally, when your opponent is split, we didn't go over, for instance, slotting plays. Like, you generally wouldn't want to split slot your five point if your opponent is split and suddenly he's got 20 shots at you in rare cases it's still right but that doesn't mean it's still not a, a good principle not to do that on the whole but you just have to learn the exceptions to the extent that they cost you enough that you want to worry about them this uh, is a really good position albert yeah it is because <laughs> um, it really makes you think okay yeah yeah, and sometimes you just throw up your hands and play 13-8. <laughs> and it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but, um, yeah, oh, and actually another interesting thing here, though, is that if you're going to split, it's important to split the better way. Stepping all the way up to the 21 rather than the 22. Um, we had that point earlier where you don't want to step into the point they most want to make. You know, you are stepping to the point they would prefer to make, you know, the 21 versus the 22, but at least it's not the 20. Usually if you have a choice between these two, you do want to take the higher if you're going to go ahead and split. And that that does show show here because right. splitting the wrong way is 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 pretty costly. Oh, okay. one seven. It's not huge, but it's solidly wrong. Okay. Yeah. And so I would just continue here. Um, and I like to continue. So, okay, three, four. Clearly, we're going to grab this anchor, right? Oops. Um, forget how to do the small one first. Three. Ah, down. Oh, wow. Now we've got an advanced anchor. <clears throat> we're not that worried about the fly shots. There's nothing better to do with the four. I don't think you want to hit on the deuce. He's got a stronger board. You don't really want to be in a blot hitting contest. Uh, so you've got your nice advanced anchor. He hits you. Now at this point, I would say the early exchange is over. We've established an advanced anchor, right? Now we're getting hit. Now we're moving into kind of the middle game. So I would stop here if I'm practicing my replies. Double. And I would just start a new one just play it like three or four exchanges 
Same opening. I can't believe we're just getting the same all the time. Well, six one is natural. Nice to get a natural for a change. Wow, look at these rails. Five three on the head seems natural. Generally, you want to point on people if you can. Five two. What do you guys think here? Hit. Right. Got a stronger board. You don't want your opponent to make that great point. Uh, if they don't roll well here, you'll probably have a big cube, right? And they dance. And that's as far as I would take this. You guys think this is a take, incidentally? Pretty clear it's a double. Got takers or passers here. I don't know. I'd probably take, but I take Double too much. Drop. Yeah, he drops. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, you get the idea there. And that's that's a really good use of XG. Is just this that's called uh, deliberate practice. You just practice in the open replies and two or three exchanges to get a feel for the rough and tumble, the early game. And you can do this. Uh, I did this a lot learning to bear in against an ace point anchor. You know those games where you lose if you get hit? <laughs> It's really nice to learn how to bear in really safely against that. So you can just set up any position and just copy it, paste it in, play it over and over and over. And um, it can be really a kind of playing against XG to to learn backgammon can be really discouraging. Um, you know, you're just you're just saying wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong all the time, and. Um, you know, all sorts of different topics are coming up. So if you can isolate a topic uh, like this by copying it and pasting it in, play from position over and over again, uh, it's a really nice use of a tool. I'm going to put a link to Extreme Gammon in the chat too. Mm -hmm. I think most of us do have the program, but maybe some people don't. And if you don't, it it is a really good investment. It, it does really, really mm. help your game to have the program. Right. And here's this slide. You could take a screenshot of it if you want to have it right away. Um, where I just, this is just the, the list of steps I took to, uh, to do that. Uh, just step by step. And I tried to give little pictures. Sometimes it's hard in XG to find all the controls because they're all over the place. But um, I hope that might be useful. All right, that's about it. So just you know, like in some opening reply method, note your opponent's opening stance. You know, what do they open with? Before you even roll the dice, you're thinking, what are they threatening? Priming, attacking, racing. And then counter your opponent's game plan. Try not to play into it. Try to do something that frustrates them or that doesn't play into that. So if they're priming you, you got to split. And weigh your opening imperatives. Blots want hitting. Points want making. Stragglers want splitting. And stacks want unstacking. Break the mountain. Uh, and then practice the opening three, five, ex three to five exchanges again to XG. And also just devote time to reviewing your early game errors. So if you're playing on, on Galaxy, you know, and at the end, you can see the errors. <clears throat> you don't have to look at every single error. It, it can be discouraging to do so. Uh, you know, maybe for a while, if you're, you know, work on one part of your game at a time. And if the opening is something you want to work on, you know, just play matches for fun, but really look at how you played the opening and any mistakes there, even if they're small. You know, usually you, you look for the red ones, you know, the, the, red, the red dots or, or, or squares because those are the big blunders. You're not going to get reds in the opening that much, but the greens you should you should track down and see if you can get a little more accurate on that. And then you'll wind up in the driver's seat more often uh, in, your, in your middle games because you're playing the opening right. That's it. Thank you, Albert. 
Thank you, Albert. You're Much welcome. appreciated. This is wonderful. Um, Very good. Yeah, it's so our open opening moves are so important to setting the tempo and tone of the game. Um, so thank you for those resources and your presentation. I know I learned a lot. I think all of us um, got something valuable today. It's something that uh, even if we've been playing for a while, it's good to go over it and, and remind ourselves of these concepts. So we really appreciate it. Uh, Albert did so the, send me- One other thing I was gonna mention that I forgot was that it actually makes the game more fun to be thinking, in these really concrete ways, because I think I used to just kind of play the opening, just, you know, blah, 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 until something interesting came up. And it's become much more interesting now, you know, weighing these different things. It's more deliberate. It's kind of like going to a baseball game or the opera and knowing what's going on. You know, it's just, uh, it's more intriguing. Anyway. Nice. Agree. So I do have the PDF that you sent me and I will send it around ladies um, via email afterwards um, and it would be great to get that slide as well that has the instructions on how to do the practice in XG you could send me that I, I sure happy to share those resources with the ladies does anyone have um, any questions for Albert before we wrap up very good thank you so much yeah thank you Albert yeah, for joining welcome. us